Canada is one of the world's top oil and gas producing countries. The sector contributes billions to our gross domestic product and government coffers. Yet Canada isn't exactly awash in oil money as some other petroleum producing states are. Why not? And could we better manage the wealth that comes from this industry? To help us with that, we welcome, in Calgary, Alberta, Chris Bloomer. That's him on the right. He's president and CEO of the Canadian Energy Pipeline Association. And Chris Turner, author most recently of The Patch, The People, Pipelines and Politics of the Oil Sands. And in the nation's capital, Monica Gattinger, director of the University of Ottawa's Institute for Science, Society and Policy and chair of its Positive Energy Project. And it's good to welcome Chris Turner back onto TVO. I know you've been on the program before, uh, as has Monica, Chris Bloomer, for the first time. Good to have you along. Let's just right, uh, right away get to this graphic here, which will uh, speak volumes about where we are in the world right now. The top five producers, as measured in barrels per day of oil, you've got the United States in first, more than 15 million, Saudi Arabia second, more than 12 million, Russia in third at more than 11 million, about half that, Canada, we're next, almost 5 million. And then China, creeping up behind us again, uh, 4.7 million and change. Let me just ask in a very sort of uh, neutral, open-ended way, Monica Gattinger to you first, what do those numbers say to you? Well, I think it's it's an, another set of figures that you could have shown actually would be not only the production figures, but also the reserve figures. If you look at um, proven reserves globally, um, Canada comes in number three after Venezuela and after Saudi Arabia. And yet uh, we're the first country on that list when it comes to being a Western industrialized democracy. And I think this is very important when it comes to thinking about Canadian energy production, particularly oil and gas uh, production, because we're facing some pretty substantial challenges in the country when it comes to uh, social acceptance and working through some of the concerns that folks have around the development of our oil and gas resources. So there's no question that the potential is there. The reserve um, uh, potential is extraordinary but we're not seeing the level of production that we might otherwise see as a result of needing to work through some of these challenges when it comes to being a democracy and developing oil and gas resources in an environment where we have concerns over climate change, reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, the involvement of communities and the like. Chris Bloomer, what do you say? Well, I'll build on what uh, Monica uh, outlined on, on the potential side of things. Canada is probably you know one or two in terms of reserve potential. And if you look at uh, what the NEB just came out with a forecast of uh, potential growth in energy production in Canada, they say by 2040, Canada could be producing 7.2 million barrels a day. That's almost double what we're producing right now. So it begs the question, we have this huge resource base that can contribute to world energy demand in a sustainable and safe way and, and in a democratic country that that uh, you know, the benefits are spread across the, the nation. So we have this incredible potential. And if you think of doubling the, the impact of the oil and gas industry on Canadians' economy, it is a tremendous amount of risk that we lose that if we don't get the situation right going forward. So we have the reserves, we have the potential, we need to act on it. Chris Turner, what would you add to that? Uh, well, I think, you know, looking at those numbers, uh, one of the more interesting ones, particularly when we get into the political dimension of this, and specifically the politics, uh, fairly confused politics in a, lot of, in a lot of cases around climate change internationally, uh, you look at the U.S. figure, U.S. at, at 15 million barrels a day, S it, during the past, you know, roughly de 10 years where there's been extraordinary uh, uh, attention and friction around pipeline projects in Canada, what we're going to do about the oil sands growth, that sort of thing, the U.S. has added new production greater than Canada. Canada's entire production. And that's really, the, that is, you know, whatever we decide to do here in Canada, that is the current direction of the, of, of the global industry, is there, there is still an extraordinary amount of, 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 of growth. Uh, demand is still very, very strong. And so I think when we discuss this, uh, this issue in Canada, we have to keep in mind, there is still enormous uh, pressure and enormous benefit uh, to, to getting this stuff to market. So Monica, let's do a little, um Let's do a little pipelines and oil sector 101 here and uh, give us your understanding of why we're not producing as much as you think we ought to be. Well, uh, 
There's no single reason. I think that's the most important place uh, to start. I've been leading a research and engagement initiative at the University of Ottawa now called Positive Energy for the last uh, number of years. And, you know, one of the things that, that we've been able to frame up is why are we facing some of these challenges when it comes to social opposition and other forms of um, controversy around our energy projects? And, and the reality, Steve, is that there isn't a single reason. There are a multiplicity of reasons. And I'm just going to take you through a couple of them uh, here that are that are most relevant. Sure. I think one of the really important things to note is that many of our decision-making systems to produce energy in this country uh, were developed in the early post-war period. And you know, between the 1950s and where are we now, 2019, things have changed pretty substantially when it comes to people's values and society. And so we're seeing people with lower levels of trust uh, in government, in industry, uh, sorry, Steve, but also in media. Um, we're seeing at the same time uh, folks not being uh, deferring uh, to decisions, whether those are government decisions, industry decisions, or, or other folks' decisions. But at the same time, people want to be involved in decisions that affect them. So a growing level of expectation uh, for democratization and involvement uh, in decision-making. And yet our decision-making systems haven't necessarily been set up to address some of those challenges. Uh, at the same time, we've had, you know, over the course of our energy history, in the last number of decades, some really important big policy issues that have come down the pike. Climate change is certainly uh, one of them, one of the big ones, but other environmental impacts of energy as well. And then in the Canadian context, reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. And both of those areas, reconciliation and environmental impacts, those are much broader questions of public policy that often, because they haven't necessarily been dealt with at that policy level, are actually kind of washing up on the shores or on the shoulders of individual pipelines projects. So we're seeing folks actually opposing pipelines for much broader questions of public policy and not necessarily having a lot of confidence in the decision-making arrangements that uh, Canada has in place to, to take decisions on those pipeline projects. Chris Bloomer, that's a pretty uh, exhaustive and intense list of things. Is there anything you'd add to it <laughs> as to why we aren't that's producing a, a, as much as you think we should? That's a very good, good list and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just hone in on the one aspect of it is the fact that the pipeline industry, the big transmission pipeline uh, projects and the existing system and so on have become the focal point and kind of the, uh, the collection point where all these issues uh, get focused from climate to indigenous to getting off of, of fossil fuels, leaving it in the ground, all the activism around pipelines because it, is, it has been the focal point. But it doesn't, it doesn't really um, address the issues for the long term. We're going to need, uh, as Chris has said, we're going to need uh, oil and gas energy in Canada for a long time. And we do need to evolve our energy system and we need to change the dialogue and how we approach these issues. Pipelines are safe. It, they've been proven to be safe. They're the best ways to move the commodity to market. Hmm. Uh, for incremental uh, production, we have to get to new markets. We have to get better value for our product. And as Chris also mentioned before, the U.S. is now our competitor, not our best customer. So we really do need a new strategic viewpoint and then and that has to come from you know the the federal government to say look at this is the business that we're in this is how we're going to do it we're going to do it the best way possible and we're going to do it uh, in a sustainable way and we can have an impact on the world in terms of how we do it uh, and how we supply that that necessary uh, demand for oil and gas before we consider that issue chris turner i do want to get you to to uh, help us understand why I mean, pipelines are not a new thing. Pipelines have been in the ground for decades, and yet the intensity of the opposition against them seems to be a relatively new thing. Why do you mm -hmm. think? Well, definitely uh, pipelines, and particularly pipelines carrying uh, Alberta bitumen uh, from, from the oil sands to the world markets, were either, you know, from the activist side, right place at the right time, from the industry side, obviously, wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, there was an extraordinary uh, amount of difficulty had by people trying to advocate for climate politics in this country and beyond in getting f real focus and attention on the issue. And uh, pipelines, particularly, you know, when Keystone XL was sort of the, the, the beginning of, the, of the, the really intense period of this conversation, 
arrived on the the sort of political radar right at a moment where uh, you know environmental groups wanted you know a campaign to focus on where there was the, you know this uh, uh, sort of renewed effort to try and galvanize public uh, attention on climate change and to some degree it was arbitrary that that was the 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 issue that was picked now that said uh, if it was arbitrary it's not an accident that the attention focused there because I think out of the gate, um, but the, you know, the, the Canadian government at the time, the Alberta government at the time, some, some players in the industry as well, didn't realize where they had wound up yeah. and didn't quite mm -hmm. see the, 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 the full landscape of, of protest and conflict and, and, and the rest of it that was now emerging. They were thinking, well, we've been doing pipelines forever, as you said. Why now is this suddenly such an enormous problem? And that really, you know, it's just really snowballed from there. And, you know, as... as as Chris Bloomer said, the the um, it now you know the the baggage being carried on every pipeline project is you know basically the three or four most contentious issues in Canadian politics every single time one of these comes up, and we begin whether we like it or not that's where that conversation begins every time, and it's a, it's a very very difficult thing politically to to, to sort out and, and 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 focus on the actual issues and not all this other baggage that's being carried by it. So Monica, would it be accurate to characterize this as as the pipeline has become a kind of a symbol of everything? that environmentalists, <clears throat> excuse me, don't like uh, about the oil and gas sector right now, as opposed to having perhaps genuine criticisms on the merits about the safety or unsafety of them? I think I would say to some extent, uh, yes, but I think it's also important to recognize uh, that it's not just pipelines that are in the crosshairs of uh, social opposition to energy development. I mean, this is a much broader phenomenon that we see affecting other energy sources as well, um, whether it's, you know, electricity transmission lines, uh, hydro developments, nuclear, uh, nuclear developments and the like. What I think is quite uh, interesting about the pipeline sector, though, I think is, as was mentioned, that it has become um, certainly a, a galvanizing point, but they're also really interesting projects from the perspective of opposition in that they're what is often referred to uh, in the sector as linear projects, right? So they, they pass through multiple communities. And I think it really raises some very interesting questions about how do you take decisions about energy uh, in the 21st century? Uh, who decides? Who ultimately decides? When you've got a project like this that passes through multiple communities, is the standard that every single member of every single community needs to be on side for the project? Because with these linear projects, as we've seen in many instances, all it can take is, you know, a small group or a small community uh, to be opposing the project project and shining a lot of light on it, even if there have been multiple uh, negotiations and agreements with other communities along uh, along the pipeline route uh, that are in support uh, of the project. So this fundamentally, I think, for Canada is a very big question is how do you decide on these projects and who ultimately decides and what's the standard by which we make a decision to go forward on, on these projects? Those are great questions and I want Chris Bloomer to answer all of them right now, which is to say... <laughs> Uh, really, who should be the decider here? Should the federal <laughs> government simply say it's our decision and it doesn't matter what the provinces say, it doesn't matter what the municipalities say, it doesn't matter what perhaps indigenous yeah. groups along the way say? How do we figure yeah. this out? Well, this is really at the heart of the matter because our regulatory system, our processes, um, you know, we, we go back, we talk about uh, the, the industry has been around for 60 years, we have built pipelines, we have access to new markets, we've built our industry into the U.S. and so on. So we've done all these things with processes that got things done. But society moves on, social uh, expectations change, government expectations change. So we have a system now where we're told it's broken, it, we, we're told it's not uh, trusted and so on. And, uh, you know, for the past two and a half years, we've gone through a consultation process with the federal government to, uh, you know, refresh, renew, uh, revise the, uh, the whole process to evaluate these processes and projects. And we've come out with legislation now that uh, I think there's a much broader uh, uh, group of resource developers and infrastructure developers look at that and say, this new legislation in Bill C-69 is going to make it worse. So the fundamental thing is our processes to address these things are still unresolved and we're not moving down a path, it seems, with this new legislation to be able to resolve it. So we've still got a lot of work ahead of us and, um, you know, unless this, this uh, regulatory framework creates the certainty and clarity around how these projects are assessed, not just for pipelines but across the board for resources, 
we're going to still have a lot of problems going forward, and we need to focus on that. Chris Turner, we just, I mean, I think it's fair to say, we just simply do not live in a world anymore where the federal government gets to survey the landscape, make a decision, and then that's it, right? Everybody expects to have a say. And, and how do we find the sweet spot of what is too much consultation, what is not enough consultation, and at what point do we actually make a decision? How do we figure all that out? Right, it, it, you know, as, as as you're hearing from from all your guests today, extraordinarily complex thing. And and you look at, I mean, just the the fact of, uh, just to, to focus in on on ind indigenous rights and and the role of First Nations in the in this conversation. You know, 50, 60 years ago, they essentially had no role. And part of you know, I think the degree of pushback that you see from indigenous groups is because they're well aware of that now, that they were not really properly consulted ever. And so now you've got, I mean, you look at something like the, you see it with Trans Mountain, but the coastal gas link pipeline uh, controversy where you have the federal government um, you know, consulting with band councils and getting the approval and buy-in of band councils, which historically was sufficient, but which courts have incre increasingly said, you know, a lot of the, the, the real authority in those communities resides in these, um, and these hereditary uh, 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 leaderships and hereditary councils. Um, and that is not an issue just for a pipeline to deal with. That is a, a fundamental issue of Canada's relationship with its, with, with its indigenous people and, and a thing that's extraordinarily hard to sort out on the fly through a particular pipeline uh, mm. approval process. Uh, if I had a really short answer for how to fix it, uh, I, would, I would say it right now and, and we could all go home. But uh, it's, uh, this is going to be a conversation that I think is only going to get more complicated yeah. and more complex before, before, it gets, before it simplifies itself. Okay, well, let me ask Chris Bloomer maybe to follow up on that. Do they have the same problem getting these things done in the United States where there are similar multiple jurisdictions and indigenous people's interests and so on? And if they don't, why not? Well, they do have a, a similar issues in the U.S. There's been a lot of pushback on oil and gas development uh, in, in states like Colorado. We're seeing the, uh, the expansion of pipelines from Canada and the U.S. or even refurbishment of pipelines from Canada and the U.S. meeting local indigenous. We have the Dakota access issue and so on. Uh, so these are, these are societal issues that, that are at play here. Uh, but. But I think, you know, there is some hope in all of this. If we look at the Angus Reid poll that came out, which basically was polling Canadians around this issue, they're saying that across the board in all the provinces, and I think even 40% in Quebec, that the pipeline issue is a crisis. You know what, Chris? I got those numbers right here. Why don't we put them up so that everybody can see okay. them here? So let's do that. Yeah, Angus Reid did survey, you know, are we in a crisis situation with our inability to build pipelines right now? And for those who said, yes, it is a crisis, Across the country, 58% said yes. In British Columbia, where of course uh, this has been a huge issue for the last number of years, 53% said yes. In Alberta, you won't be surprised to hear 87% say yes, the inability to build pipelines is a crisis. Even in Ontario, where last I checked, we don't do a lot of uh, oil drilling, 61% uh, said yes. And yes, as you get to Quebec, uh, the number does get smaller, 40%. So what do you infer from all that, Chris Bloomer? Well, I think, I think the, uh, what's really uh, starting to take hold is, is that there's a broader recognition that this is an issue for the economy. This is an issue, not just an Alberta issue, it's a Canadian issue, and that it also affects the economy. The other data in the Angus Reid poll says that uh, the provinces view that the, the negative impact on the oil and gas industry of not having access to markets is damaging their economies too. So it's being felt across the country. and and. I, there is uh, the kind of uh, a, a realization that uh, this is an issue for everybody, not just for Alberta, and, and we're not going in the right direction. So there, is, so there is a lot of hope for that. You mentioned Ontario. Ontario is um, becoming more and more progressive on looking at what is an energy evolution, what is the energy future, what is the energy mix? They're becoming more pragmatic. You're seeing that government, which is a, which is a, a key market in Canada, uh, being more pragmatic about how this fits. And they, they view that the situation is harming their economy and they want to turn it around. So I think there is a change in the wind. I think people are realizing it's, it's going to hit their uh, back pockets and that um, it is a crisis and we need to deal with it and, it and it lands at the federal doorstep in that regard. Monica, I do want to understand something better though and that is that w we've established here that, that all of the intricacies and difficulties of, of doing this business in Canada because of multiple jurisdictions and, and taking heed of uh, indigenous interests and so on uh, is sort of unprecedentedly complicated. 
and yet those same conditions in, exist in the United States, and they have managed to increase their production significantly. What are they doing differently from us? Well, I, I would point to a, a few things that don't necessarily have to do with them doing things differently, and more to do with their own geological and geographic circumstances, a lot of the new production and a lot of the new infrastructure is actually in areas of the country that, that are relatively used to having that infrastructure. So if you look at the massive pipeline expansions and, and expansion in production in, in Texas, for example, this is a jurisdiction that, that is accustomed uh, to, uh, to that kind of activity. I think the difference here in Canada is that, you know, as Chris Bloomer mentioned earlier, we're finding the United States increasingly becoming not only customer for, but also competitor uh, to Canada. Canada in, in both oil and gas markets, which means that for the first time, what's truly unprecedented for Canadian energy producers in the oil and gas sector is that they need to look at international exports beyond North America. So that means, you know, in, the lingo is getting to tidewater uh, to be able to access markets, whether it's in Asia or in Europe. And, and that means putting infrastructure in place, pretty substantial pieces of infrastructure in areas of the country that have not necessarily seen that kind of activity in terms of construction. Uh, for many, many years and aren't accustomed to it. So I think there's, there's certainly, uh, that is one of the differences there. I think one of the other differences in the Canadian context is uh, really the increasing recognition, as was pointed out earlier, uh, of uh, reconciliation with Indigenous peoples and you know a, a string of court cases uh, affirming and, and expanding uh, Indigenous rights and, and title. Uh, and that has really changed, uh, certainly changed the, uh, the conversation uh, as well in Canada. Well, Chris Bloomer, that's the thing, right? I mean, the federal government could put a new process in place where they say, for example, we're going to take two years, we're going to consult widely. At the end of the two years, we're going to make a decision, and that's it. But then, of course, anybody can take anybody to court, and it can go on for years and years and years. So uh, I guess, you know, in a way, it's the same yeah. question. But, but even if you get the federal government to do what you want the federal government to do, that's not it, is it? Well... You know, the federal government does have the jurisdiction to do this. And I think the, the, one of the things that's really lacking is, is the context in which we're having this discussion in a very broad strategic sense. And that is that Canada is in the business of resource developments and in the business of oil and gas development as to the benefit of everybody. Um, and I think that message needs to come through and there needs to be a, a strategy rather than, you know, uh, what's viewed as leaving, leaving this asset in the ground, these resources in the ground, kind of saying, look, at, let's, let's make the most that we can of it. Let's do it in the best way possible, the safest way possible. And let's take those benefits and let's put it back into those things that we want to do. We have to be more pragmatic about it. And I think if there was a more holistic, I mean, imagine what we can do with all that, all that resource potential. And, and I think if, you know, it, it, will, it will help indigenous groups come together. It will help do the, the, the change to more renewable resources, and Canada already has a lot. So it's how this is this positioned strategically and how it is uh, positioned with, the, with Can Canadians in terms of the importance of it and how we should use it to our benefit to do the things that we want. We're not seeing that right now. We're not getting the whole message. I do want Monica to follow up on that in this regard, though. Uh, Chris, in the midst of that answer, did say it's not an option to leave this resource in the ground. Uh, I don't have to tell you, Monica, there are plenty of Canadians who think that is exactly what should be done, uh, that, that taking this stuff out of the ground is ruining our planet, ruining the environment, and that we should just leave it in the ground. Is that an option? Well, I think it's really important for the country to have a, a sober, uh, informed, evidence-based discussion on, on these issues. I mean, one of the things that uh, that we see in the public opinion polling data that you just showed, uh, Steve, that, that is very in line with the work that we've done, uh, we've done a lot of public opinion polling uh, with Nanos uh, research, that really underscores that while in the headlines what we see is often very polarized and polarizing and sort of either or, uh, discussions of, of, of energy issues, the average Canadian is actually quite pragmatic uh, on these issues, and the vast majority of Canadians, in poll after poll that we've undertaken, support oil and gas development, and in fact support uh, expanded oil and gas development. What they, what they don't uh, see, though, to the point that Chris Bloomer was just making, and where they really score governments very low, is not having a vision 
for Canada's energy future and not necessarily having confidence in the decision making processes that governments have in place uh, for taking uh, for taking decisions about energy projects. Um, if you if you poll Canadians about their you know their views on Canada's energy future, they are very um, confident that the country can develop its energy resources, including oil and gas, in ways that protect the environment. What I think they're missing, and they say this in poll after poll, is a vision for what that future looks like. And that's something, uh, and I would reiterate Chris Bloomer's point, that's something that we don't have in, in Canada. And it's a challenge, uh, admittedly, to, to develop that in a federation with very different regional interests uh, and for which the provincial governments have constitutional jurisdiction over non-renewable resources. It makes it uh, a, a complex task, to be sure. Well, let me get Chris Turner to compare and contrast. If we're looking for a vision, Norway has been down this path. They are, like us, a northern nation, very much invested in the oil and gas business. What and how have they done it? Uh, well, I mean, I think that the thing people often point to when, when Norway comes up is, you know, they, they uh, uh, made sure that the, the revenue that was generated by their, their oil and gas sector was, was saved carefully, developed into a sovereign wealth fund, that that sovereign wealth fund would be, you know, uh, invested abroad so that it wouldn't um, distort the economics of, of Norway itself. And it is now turned into this this extraordinary gift to future generations of Norwegians because it, it is an extra huge and growing, uh, you know, multi-billion dollar fund. Um, the big difference, though, whenever Norway comes up, is Canada simply doesn't. You know, Norway is a single country, unified country. Their energy uh, policy is entirely federal or national uh, government controlled, where, where you see a lot of the friction in Canada is because energy is, you know, an interprovincial issue. And uh, climate change to some degree is an interprovincial issue. And then you also have indigenous, indigenous rights and indigenous groups uh, uh, with their position in, in among that. You just don't have that degree of, of uh, sort of friction and conflict in the Norwegian discussion around, you know, how to develop and, and how best to, to, to reap benefit from uh, their resources. Now, Canada's historically done okay on all this, uh, I, I think, you know, the, in terms of developing the resources. But what's happened is that there are now these new questions being introduced uh, into processes that weren't really built to, to uh, address them. And climate change is a great example of that. N nothing about the way the National Energy Board was set up was, was designed to deal with the climate impacts of energy projects. But we know, practically speaking, that there are climate impacts and that they do need to be taken into account. And I think this is where you see, you know, uh, Canadians not sure where their governments are going, uh, not getting the whole vision. Even if those pieces are all in place, they're, they're not all presented as a single package. And, and so we don't get the sense. I mean, most Canadians do say, yes, we're open to, you know, more oil and gas production, but we also really want to see a robust and meaningful uh, 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 regime on climate change. They don't see that all coming together because there's too many different and competing governments involved. And there's really easy political points to be scored grandstanding on one of the other sides of it. And so mm -hmm. I think that's what you see, you know, things like, you know, pipeline approval plus a carbon tax and all the other stuff that was in the federal provincial climate plan kind of made sense in the in the in the in the broad sweep of it but all that as soon as the pipeline issue became volatile just vanished into you know uh, us against them we're going to abolish the carbon tax uh, you know the the BC government on the other end of things saying you know no way no how are we going to you know every tool in the toolkit to stop trans mountain and so that a uh, more kind of pragmatic approach that I think most Canadians want to see just vanishes into uh, the, that, that rancorous debate. Okay, if I understood that answer then, Chris Bloomer, we, we have a situation where Norway is really not an example to us for all of the reasons that Chris Turner just described. We have institutions in this country which, given the passage of time and perhaps change of values, are no longer up to the task of doing uh, what they have done in the past and what we need them to do right now. My guess is when you go to sleep at night, you are thoroughly depressed at the inability of this country to do anything. Is that right? Uh, no, I'm an optimist. Uh, and I think based uh, on there, what there is. Well, there is hope. I think I think the what we're seeing in, in things uh, out there, it's not a, it's not a short term turnaround or solution. But I think people's attitudes are more engaged now on this issue. And it's very visible. And I want to I, I want to make another point uh, along these lines is that the climate change issue is a global issue and and we're we're as a country wanting to do our what we can do to address that issue uh not not arguing that but there's another fundamental issue in the world is poverty and global energy poverty and lifting people out of poverty 
to, to move away from b burning wood and, and, and dung and so on. It's, it's, it sounds, it's not a joke. This is a, this is a real issue, energy poverty in the world. And how can we play in lifting those, those, um, those uh, uh, people out of poverty and, and develop energy in a responsible, sustainable way and show the world how to do that? That's another important question that we need to, when we're looking at the global impact of what we're doing, we can help with reducing global energy poverty, and that's really, really important. But I do have hope. I think that, you know, um, ideology tends to bump up against reality, and I think we're starting to see that now. We need to really say what's in our best interests, and our best interests are to have a robust oil and gas pipeline transmission system, do it environmentally sustainably responsible, get our indigenous uh, communities involved to the, to the maximum extent, because the prize is huge. And there's enough there for all of us, and we can contribute in a very positive way on a global stage with respect to that. Well, that's the very challenge I'm going to put to Monica right now, which is, okay, what does a policy look like that respects Indigenous rights, that respects provincial boundaries, that respects the federal government's need to, to get this industry going, uh, and that respects the environment? Is it possible to craft that kind of policy? <laughs> Boy, if I had that answer, uh, Steve. Mm -hmm. um, certainly we can do better than, than we're doing now. I think, you know, one of the things that we've pointed to in our work is really the importance of uh, for governments to develop a workable balance, uh, a workable and durable balance between various energy imperatives. Um, you know, there's certainly there are the economic imperatives that have been pointed to here in terms of the resource wealth that can be generated as a result of the development of Canada's resource resource the need to have a, you know, a competitive uh, uh, investment environment and the competitiveness of the industry. But there are also, as we know, environmental uh, imperatives as well. And certainly climate change is among those, but it's also uh, impacts, local impacts on, on land and on water uh, and the like. But there are also security imperatives, ensuring that we've got reliable, uh, affordable uh, energy. And, and when governments don't find a workable, durable balance between those uh, imperatives in ways that, that secure social uh, acceptance, they find themselves going off the rails uh, relatively quickly. And I mean, we've seen this in France with uh, Les Gilets Jaunes, and certainly what, uh, what brought that uh, to a head uh, initially was uh, the price uh, of fuel, uh, and notably the government's decision to put in place a, a carbon tax. Uh, and we've seen that to some extent happening here in the Canadian context as well. So really trying to find that, that balance Balance. And when we are then reforming our decision-making systems or reforming our policies, to do it in an informed way that looks not only at the intended consequences, but also unintended consequences. And, and like Chris Bloomer, I'm also an optimist, but at the same time, we have to be realistic as well. And we are seeing, to some degree, uh, Canadian companies in the Canadian context, energy companies, uh, beginning to, to rethink their uh, investments uh, towards other countries, and in part because of the challenges that they're seeing in terms of the investment climate in Canada. Well, I know Chris Bloomer is an optimist, and I don't want to be a killjoy here, but I'm going to give the last minute here to, uh, to our author, Chris Turner, because a part of the subtitle of his book is The Politics of All of This. Mm -hmm. And the reality is we're in an election year right now, which means uh, there's every possibility nothing is going to happen in the next 10 months because uh, the politics of this, Chris Turner, are, it seems to me, next to impossible for the prime minister who depends on the votes of environmentalists to get elected, who depend, you know, depends uh, on winning some seats in Western Canada uh, in order to have a good, strong-sized majority government, who has pledged to improve uh, the Crown's relations with Indigenous peoples across the country and trying to satisfy all those different political pressure points I, I, okay, you tell me. How do you do that? <laughs> well, this, I mean, uh, this has always been the, you know, the Liberal Party of Canada's great strength is somehow managing to, you know, keep all of those, those uh, uh, different forces uh, uh, in society roughly moving in the same direction, even as there's a lot of uh, friction along the way. Certainly, near term, I'm not terribly optimistic that the conversation around this particular uh, issue, energy, climate, pipelines, all of that gets a lot clearer in the public domain. Uh, I think there's far too much, as I said, easy political capital to be scored by, you know, taking a strong, hard stance, uh, you know, for or against a, a carbon tax. I think that's going to be a big issue federally. Uh, I think it's very easy if you're in opposition right now to say, you know, we would just get it done if we were in power. 
uh, which completely ignores the fact that, you know, whoever the government of the day is, they have to obey the rule of law and the ruling of a federal court, which is why we're still talking about Trans Mountain. So the actual issues on the ground aren't going anywhere. And I do think that, that you know, we do have the tools and we do have the, the, the ability as a nation to, to, to sort them out. Uh, my sense is that the politics might continue to get worse before they get better around it, though, that there's going to be a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of really, really strong, heated talk, uh, a lot of heat and maybe not so much light in the next little while. And I think that that's to the detriment you know, of, of everyone who has a stake in this, uh, which is basically everyone in the country. And on that happy note, we thank Chris Turner. <laughs> More on this in his book, The Patch, The People, Pipelines and Politics of the Oil Sands. Chris Bloomer was sitting beside him. He's the CEO of the Canadian Energy Pipeline Association and in the nation's capital, Monica Gattinger from the University of Ottawa and chair of Positive Energy. Good of all three of you to come on to TVO tonight and help us out with this. Thanks so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.